Well, welcome to our Christmas series, Guess Who's Coming to Christmas. And uh, last week, Tyler did a great job talking about the Grinch. And uh, there's something about Christmas that just throws us all together in the worst per- possible circumstances. Because it tends to be, uh, Tyler really coined it well last week, Christmas is like an extra job. It really is. It's like working another job for the month of December. Uh, people often ask me, is December busy for you? And, and I always tell them no, because nobody wants me. Everybody's so busy with their own family stuff and everything like that. My phone goes quiet. You know, like it's just, it's just really quiet because everybody is so consumed preparing for Christmas, preparing food and decorations and presents and all those kind of things. And, and sometimes one of the worst things that people in the church do is they, they get people into church and then they make them feel guilty about Christmas because they tell them they're doing it wrong, right? Or they complain about how society is doing it wrong or anything like that. We, we, are, we always have a guilt-free Christmas here for a couple of reasons. One is Christmas is awesome. And two, I'm completely materialistic. I'm all about the gifts. I get my family to get me gifts. I buy myself gifts, and I wrap them and put them under the tree for myself. I am the most materialistic, narcissistic person when it comes to Christmas. I also have a little bit of uh, the dramatic in me. Uh, One course all the way through high school, I got straight A's, was drama. I know you can't believe that, but I did. Um, so we're talking today about the second person might be coming to Christmas. And, and so at Christmas, you get all these personalities, and it tends to be we're in a worse mood because we got this extra job, and we're tired, and we're strung out on sugar, and all those kind of things. And, and we are heading towards the cliff, which is Christmas. And then we head into January, and then we are all got sh- you know sugar hangovers, and we're broke, and it's cold out, and it's lousy, and all that. We'll deal with that when we get there. But right now, we're talking about different personalities that you may encounter at Christmas, and one of them is a, what I call the drama queen, okay? Now, just for equal opportunity, there's lots of drama kings out there as well, okay? I'm just referring to this. Last week, we talked about the Grinch in male terms. This week, we're going to talk about the drama queen in female terms. It's not because I want half of you to get mad at me. It's just I'm just doing it, okay? All right? So, so be easy. It's Christmas. Be nice. Have a generous spirit. So the drama queen, first of all, I want to say about dramatic people, is that we need to thank God that they're in this world. We really do. Because they kind of add the color to our black and white existence. They are the people that spice up life. Um, often it's those dramatic people that work in your office and they come in and they've, the weirdest things happen to dramatic people. Anybody says that God doesn't have a sense of humor? Um, really, there's some people out there and God just does weird things with them and they go through the weirdest experiences and then they retell the story and, and it just it busts you up. It's so funny. Dramatic people also are the ones that kind of move us all in the, you know, okay, if we're going to go somewhere on a journey, let's enjoy it. You know, they're the ones that put the drapes up and, you know, and bring in the the funny stuff and add chocolate to church and all that kind of stuff. So we really need to be thankful for dramatic people. They are really essential in making life, adding some color to the black and white that is life. They're the ones that help us enjoy the journey. But as anything that could be a good thing can be taken a little too far. And when something is taken a little too far, it becomes a problem. I'm popping here, uh, Radar, if you can figure out what that is and cease and desist it. Um, that'd be great. Um, so when, when we're talking about that, if it's taken too far, it sometimes becomes a burden to the people around it. And, and when I'm referring to uh, the drama queen or king, what I'm referring to is someone that uses drama to draw attention to themselves. And, and you may not believe it, but there's some people in the world that are selfish, some of us included, right? And, and so some people are never really um, satisfied with the amount of attention they get. So what they do is they spice things up in order to draw more attention to themselves so that, that they get more attention. They enjoy being the uh, you know, center of attention or the victim or the clown or anything like that. And, and when that's taken too far, um, someone like that can, can really burn some bridges relationally, but also can become a uh, distraction to life. And, and sometimes the dramatic people in our life, lives actually take us away from being able to focus on some of the good people that maybe deserve our attention more. 
God, I don't know. It's in every family, there's one very dramatic person. And you'll get, you know, they'll have 10 kids and they'll have this one, right? And they get together at Christmas and that one dominates 90% of the attention of the family. And, and eight of the nine other kids are really good kids and they don't get the attention. Now, you know, some, some people grow up in a household like that. My sisters, you know, I think they're overemphasizing it, but they always talk about the amount of attention I got. And I, you know, I wasn't trying to draw the attention. I was just awesome, and that, there's nothing you can do about that. <laughs> but, but, you know, how being the only boy in the clown really, really, I, you know, I got my attention. It wasn't always positive, but I got lots of attention growing up. So a lot of us have these people, or they're in your office, and, and they kind of come in, and they, you know, they'll play something dramatic all the time, and they draw attention away from either the goals the company's trying to attain or from the rest of the staff. And someone like that, that's kind of wrapped up in that, um, and especially when they come at Christmas, can really annoy us. And being Christians, we're not allowed to kill people. So I'm going to teach you a little bit about how to deal with a drama queen uh, in, your, in your family or in your life, because everybody has one. I'll never forget when I was working here at the college one time. This was 20-something years ago. Um, my wife and I, this is before Ryan was born, and we were in prenatal classes. And one of the couples that was in prenatal with us, their baby was due around the same time as Ryan was. Ryan ended up hanging on a couple of weeks extra, um, but this baby was born. I remember r we ran into the couple and we were in, uh, I think it was Zellers or something, and they had their little girl in the cart and, and they told to us a story. They said uh, that the husband was working and the wife called and said, my water's broke, I'll meet you at the hospital. So he kind of took his time and drove over and grabbed a coffee and he arrived in the uh, delivery room and she was halfway through delivering the baby. So the baby came very quickly for them and uh, you know it, it just kind of happened really fast. So anyways I was relating this to one of the ladies I worked with and uh, she was someone that tended to be a little dramatic and uh, she said oh you're in prenatal do you know so and so? I said yeah we do. I said, actually, their baby was born this week. She said, I heard about that. I said, really, did you? She said, yeah, this is what I heard. I heard that the nurse was coming into the room. Her water broke, and she, they put her in a bed, and the nurse came out and came into the room, and the girl said, I think I had the baby. And they looked down, and there it was. Little embellishing of the story. First of all, I can't believe a woman would actually share that. Way. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I think a woman would know having a baby is a little bit bigger a deal. Like, oops, you know, it's not like gas. It just doesn't come out. Okay, you know, this is this is a big deal, right? But but because this person was always looking to embellish and 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 be dramatic, this was how they relayed the story to me. And so we'll talk about it. First of all, what motivates a drama queen? First of all, public displays of grandeur to draw attention. Often the drama queen, the person that takes us too far, um, they find their value in having others pay attention to them. And, and they'll be on Facebook all the time or they'll be on Twitter all the time and all that and there's always a flurry of things and they'll present themselves an image or they'll draw attention at work because inside they really want to be loved and accepted. Okay, and we all want to be loved and accepted. Sometimes the dram dramatic people among us, myself included, make a little big, big, bitter de bigger deal of who we are in order to draw that attention because we want to be accepted and loved. Okay, and so that's sometimes what brings it out. And then the drama of me, there's actually a narcissistic aspect to it. Uh, the, the competition, and this is a theological truth, is way back in the garden, Adam and Eve. Eve's talking to the, the devil. And the devil says, did God really say what he said? And, and said to her, you know, if you eat this fruit, if you sin, you're going to become just like God. And so Eve ate the fruit and Adam ate the fruit. And um, they, uh, they found out that they didn't actually become more like God. They became estranged from God. It was a lie. But the lie still persists today. Is that many people... The idea, the drama that they, they live in and the way they get up in the morning, the way they look at their life is just this big soap opera because they want to be the main player in a drama where they're the star. And so sometimes you're a dramatic person. Uh, there's what um, psychologists call the self-serving bias. Everybody has it. The self-serving bias is where we tend to view the world 
through a very different lens than we actually are. And so people may look at us a certain way. We tend to lie to ourselves. We're notorious for lying to ourselves. And so we may actually think we're, you know, we're prettier or we're smarter or anything like that and, and, and because we want to draw attention. A pastor told me when I first started ministry, he said, Scott, your best sermon ever is not going to be that great you know, in comparison to what you think. And your worst sermon ever, ever is not going to be that bad. And he said, you know, inside that scope right there is probably about the norm. Just do your best before God and let him be the one that does the work, right? And, and, and there's a truth to that. But the truth is, is that to a dramatic person, if I wanted to draw attention to myself in such a way to make myself look better, then I'm going to puff myself up. The problem is, is that most people see through that, don't they? When the drama queen or drama king comes in and everything like that and they start, what do people do? A lot of times they go, oh. Again? Here we go. All right, we're on the merry-go-round again. <laughs> okay, yeah, we've heard it. Yeah, poor you, poor you, poor you. But they'll, they'll smile and nod, <laughs> you know, because they want, you know, to get through it. But the, the dramatic person is thinking, oh, they love me, you know? And the, and, and the people around them are going, again? Oh, man. Okay? Now, here's the truth, is that all of us are dramatic at one point or another. We really are. And sometimes that's a good thing. Because if you're really going through it, it, it's good that you can share it with people. People can help you carry that. I'm going to be talking about that in a minute. In fact, one of the struggles I have as a pastor is this, is people that need help that don't ask for it. You see, we have, you actually have a psychological need to give, and you also have a psychological need to be able to receive. It's a really humbling thing to ask someone for help. It really is. Um, but, but it's ironic that some people, you know, are very comfortable to have people help them and then I got to teach them how to help others. And then other people, you know, they never ask for help. They really love helping other people, but they don't want to ask for help because to them, it's like a, a sign of weakness that they ca just can't stand. You know, someone does no something nice for you and you're immediately, I got to give them something back. You know, because we have this kind of mathematics in our heart that puts us that way. So, moving on. Um, the Bible is full of people that were dramatic at one time or another. Elijah, Moses was dramatic. Um, um, Samson was a real drama queen. Uh, David could be overly dramatic. Jonah, oh my gosh. Don't ask me about Jonah. Uh, Peter, he could be very dramatic. Even Paul, in his weak, um, weak moments, was somewhat dramatic. You read 2 Corinthians, I mean, he was having a drama queen you know, episode. It's still inspired by God and Scripture and everything like that. But you could tell he was, you know, he was really embellishing things a little bit. Not to lie, but to draw attention to what he was doing. He was trying to get a message across. And he did so in a dramatic way. And especially the people in Jesus' day. Now, in Jewish society, there are eight levels of charity. It, leave, it, leave it to Hebrew society to find a complicated way to make charity. But there were eight levels of charity. The highest of the highest is you doing something anonymously for another Jew that helps them get established and, and all that kind of thing. But the seventh level of charity to a Jew is to give something anonymously to someone that you don't know is going to receive it. So you, you give a need, you give to someone who's going to give to someone. But in Jesus' day, the opposite was happening. People who gave were often on the way to the temple and they'd be beating drums and clanging cymbals. I'm bringing my offering. We're giving this big thing and, and, and things like that. It used to be, like I was talking to someone, you know, this week was mentioning this, you know, it used to be certain churches, you gave a certain amount of money and you got, you got your name on a pew and, you know, they wanted their names up in front of everybody. And, and some, some people were really into that and Jesus talked about it. And so I'm going to read you a passage today. It will be the focus of what we talk about. And we'll talk about... What, what these people, if we're being dramatic, what our are, what are actual true reward is. And I'll just uh, ask you to put the slide up. Thank you. Jesus mentioned, or he said, Watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth. They have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need... Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father who sees everything will reward you. 
In God's kingdom, the idea of charity, and this is the seventh level of Jewish giving, is, is, has an opposite effect. You see, sometimes, like if I'm giving a big gift, I want people to know because they'll admire me, right? But, but here's the truth. That is all the reward I'll ever get. Whereas Jesus said, if you really want to be rewarded by the one who truly rewards you, do it anonymously. Do, do it in such a way that it isn't a big deal. Jesus recognized that in his day, many people became very dramatic when they were doing religious things, when they fasted or prayed or gave or anything like that, because they wanted people to think they were spiritual and holy. Where Jesus says, in the kingdom of God, actually the opposite is true. If, if you're doing it just to get attention, attention's your reward. And here's the truth of the matter. Attention from other people is never going to fill the hole of acceptance that you need to fill in your life. They never will. People will always let you down. They really will. People will never make you completely feel loved. They can make you feel loved. They can make you feel loved on all kinds of levels. But the truth of the matter is, as Augustine said, every person has a God-sized hole in their heart that can only be filled by God. And so God said, with this truth in, 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 th in mind, when you give, give unto the Lord. Give it to God. So when you make your donation, don't make a big deal out of it. When you fast, take care of yourself so you don't look like you're fasting. When you're praying, go into your closet. Do it. God's upside down kingdom was less is more. And so he's saying, don't be all dramatic about it. Don't, don't display it like that. The best way in God's kingdom is with discretion. And the consequences of letting it out means the reward is lost. The real reward is acceptance from your Father in heaven. So I'm going to just walk you through some practical stuff, how to deal with the drama queen, and then what to do if you are the drama queen, okay? <laughs> so we're going to walk through these, these things very quickly, and then I'll have time for a little bit of Q&A. First part, the first question you always have to ask when you're dealing with a drama queen is, what is your proximity to the drama queen, okay? Dramatic people are looking for victims, or, I mean, friends, <laughs> okay? <laughs> a lot of times... They're looking for people that will pay attention to them. And, and they're very good at drawing people into the drama that is their reality. Okay? And a lot of times they will draw people into the reality and come across that those people need to meet a need for them that, that really isn't theirs to fill. People will always try to draw you in to, in order for you to help them in such a way that you are actually taking responsibility more for them than you would for your own spouse or your own boyfriend or your own family members. Because in their narrative, they draw attention. Sometimes it's the way they do it. And, and sometimes they will skip all kinds of levels. You know, like, uh, for instance, if you, uh, if you, your house burned down, question is, who do you have in your life that you know you could call and go stay with them right away. You know, well you, you got two people, you got three, you got none. <laughs> you know, who do you have in your life that you know you could stay with them? Well, a dramatic person adds about 20 names to that list because they don't mind asking anybody to stay over. The problem is, is that the other 15 people on that list have no interest in hosting them and shouldn't need to take care of them, right? And so there's, there's this, what's your proximity? Is this person, the burden they carry, is this your burden to carry? And if the answer is no, then it's okay to say they have a family, they have some close friends, I can help as I can, but you know I don't have to get drawn right into the center of this dramatic face. Because first of all, this person doesn't know my middle name. They may not know my last name. This person doesn't know my visa number and blood type. You know, we're not that close. And so because we're not that close, I can offer charity. But here's the thing is for a drama queen, they want to invite everybody in. And, and it may not be your burden to carry. And that's okay. You can't help everybody. In fact, you should help lots of people. But sometimes a drama queen is the last one you should help. Sometimes the people you need to help are the people that are suffering in silence off in the corner 
And when you go and you help them and you offer charity and you offer love and acceptance and grace to them, they're absolutely blown away. They're so grateful because someone saw their need. Okay? So you don't necessarily have to get drawn in in every case. Dealing with a drama queen. First of all, detect the difference between boulders and backpacks. Boulders and backpacks. I'm, I'm stealing from Cheryl Robinson's teaching because she steals from mine all the time, so I'm stealing something back, <laughs> okay? There's a passage of Scripture that says, carry one another's burdens. But the passage always goes on, also goes on to, and each person should carry their own load. And there's a difference. What is a boulder? A boulder is something you can't carry by yourself. And, and sometimes people go through things that they can't carry themselves. And as a body of Christ, and it may be a dramatic person, as a body of Christ, our responsibility is to help those people carry that boulder because they can't possibly carry it themselves. Uh, Dave and I with the Graham family. That was a boulder, Bill passing away and being sick with cancer and that. And as a church, I'll never forget, I was going to see Bill and Lindsay one time, and I went to see them like three or four times in Lindsay, and every time I went to see him, one of you guys would show up and interrupt me. And, and the nurses were like, what kind of church is this? There's like so many people coming to see this guy. It's like he's never alone kind of thing. That, that's fantastic. You know, that's a burden. That's a body of Christ showing up. Different people bought him crazy socks and sent him sick cards and, and recorded music for him and all those kinds. Of, like He felt so loved. And that's a burden. That's what we're supposed to carry. But backpacks are things that people are responsible for themselves. First of all, it is not healthy for me to believe that everybody's job is to cheer me up. You know, there are times where I'm feeling down where I really need to cheer myself up. It's not, it's not other people's responsibility to make me feel content. That's something I find in my relationship to the Lord. Contentment is not something that's your job to do for me. It's a backpack. So there's certain things that people should carry themselves. And nothing messes a church or community or family up more where people make backpacks, boulders, and boulders backpacks. You know, where they switch them. Where everybody's angry at everybody because their backpack isn't being carried when they should carry it themselves. And at the same time, everybody's ignoring the boulders that really need to be carried because they're so busy with the backpacks. Does that make sense? Is that good teaching? Cheryl's fault, all right? But that's true, okay? So recognize the difference. Second thing, and this is Cheryl again, but that's okay because I asked her and she sends me some good advice. She said, be warm and firm. Warm and firm. A dramatic person is going to come to you or, you know, come to you at Christmas or take you off in the corner and they're going to tell you a big story about, you know, all this kind of thing. And they may be asking for help or not or they, whatever. Be warm and firm. Affirm the person. Every time you greet somebody, regardless who it is, smile and say hi. I do that to my worst enemies and they love it. Be happy. Be accepting. Be warm in that. But at the same time, be firm. Being firm means being willing to say, I, I, I can't help you with that. Or be willing to say, wow, that's crazy. That's great. Let's go over here. You know, it, it, it's just to affirm the person as their people, but not necessarily, but, but to be firm in that you don't have to be sucked into their drama necessarily. I remember there was, uh, there was one time years ago and, and, and I had a person that I was working with and uh, they always had a sob story. And their sob story normally meant that they were approaching the place where I worked for money in advance. And finally the human resources department said, we're not advancing this person money ever again because what they do is they would get the money and then they wouldn't show up or do the work that they were responsible for. And, and they just burn those bridges so many times and, and they'd always come. Another really sad story. Oh, no, no, you know, all this and that. And people started going, yeah, wow, that's, that's awful. Let's go over here. You know, and, and, and just because the person had burned so many bridges. Be warm and firm. It's okay in some instances to say no. Not to your pastor, but to other people, okay? Be warm and firm without being drawn into crisis all the time. Avoid rescue and diminishing, okay? Now, this is really important. This is the wisdom of Solomon type of stuff, okay? 
it, a lot of times when someone's presenting you with something, it's wrong to necessarily rescue them all the time. Sometimes it's a one-time thing. I always, always have a philosophy with grace. I always give everybody a few strikes. You know, I'll try and help them, try and help them, try and help them. But if I don't see the change that comes with it, then after a while I kind of go, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm really a human pacifier now. I'm not necessarily helping this person. But at the same time, avoid diminishing. And so that's when the drama you know, person comes up to you and you criticize them or you undermine their story or you, you, know, you, 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 know, you call them on it and you, you try to take them down a peg. Both of these lead to crisis. If you're always rescuing the drama queen, then your life is going to be sucked into whatever drama they're a part of, and it will take all kinds of your time. If you diminish them, then you make them angry. And a drama queen could be quite effective in making your life miserable. They really can. They talk to lots of people. They go make lots, you know, all those kind of things. Be warm and firm. Affirm the person with the grace of God. Love them as a Christian brother in Christ or sister in Christ. But at the same time, be firm in that know where you need to go and know where you're not. You know something's a really big deal in the part of this? Is listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. You will feel God start to push you gently towards some of the things where you need to step in and do something. But the Holy Spirit can also check you. Where you're going, yeah, okay. Well, you know, I affirm you and all those kind of things, but, but you take a step back. Okay? Being a follower of Jesus Christ means we have God in our heart. And so he can help us with these things. So that's the Wisdom of Solomon thing. Um, and then recognize the gift the older prodigal had. And this is what, something I'm going to talk about for those of you that aren't the drama queen. Jesus once told a parable. It's a very famous parable, but not for what it really was intended for. It's called the parable of the, the prodigal son. Many of you heard it. A father had two sons. The younger one came to him and said, Father, I want you to give me my inheritance early. And quite literally what he was saying to his father is, I wish you were dead so I could have my money. It really was an insult in Eastern cu culture. It was a horrible thing to do. But the father was gracious and he gave the son the inheritance. The son went in foreign lands. He blew it all on prostitutes and drinking and carousing and partying and, and all those kind of things and then ran out of money. He ran out of money. He suddenly realized all the people that helped him party and everything like that weren't going to take care of him. They dropped him. So he's on his own, he was starving, he was feeding pigs, you know, his life was on the rocks, and so he came back to the father's house. Now in Eastern society, that son, there's no way you'd let him back. But the father sees the son from a distance, jumps off the porch, runs, hugs him, puts his finest coat on him, throws a party for him, and is so happy that his lost son has come. Now, the older son, or the first son, Never asked for his inheritance. He did the right thing. He worked on the farm. He was faithful to his father, loyal to his father. And this big party's going on, and the father looks around, and the older son isn't there. And then goes, where, where, where is he? And he finds out he's in the, actually doing work out in the crops. So he goes out to the older son, and he said, why are you here? And the older son's complaint comes out. All my life, I have slaved for you. I have done everything. And I haven't even asked for a goat so I could have a party with my friends. He's being a little dramatic himself here. But, and his father said, my son, my son, you don't realize all this is yours. The whole farm, it's yours. But I have a right when your brother is lost to want him to come home. Many of you are not drama queens. Many of you, you read your Bible, you say your prayers, you give your tithes, you volunteer, you share Jesus with your friends and neighbors, you work hard, you're humble, giving gracious people. And if God wants to tell something to you today, sometimes we look at the drama queen and then we start to hate in our heart. And we get bitter and we get angry. And Christmas, it can be especially acute, can't it? Right? Christmas, we really start to resent that person. Maybe it's a brother or sister. Maybe it's, a, it's an uncle. Or maybe it's, it's someone at work. And they draw all the attention. You're like, here I am slugging day after day. And nobody recognizes me. Jesus told that parable to a group of religious leaders who were angry that he was reaching many lost prodigals. 
And it was a gracious parable for him to tell. He could have told them all the horse off, but the parable, what he was telling them was, you know what, you have been faithful. You have been. You know, in this, this case, I don't know whether these were the Pharisees eventually crucified him or what, but he was saying to them, God hasn't forgotten you. And there is a great reward in doing the right thing for two reasons. The first is this, is there's all kinds of pain that being a lost prodigal brings to bring the drama queen. There's all kinds of things they miss out on that you are so familiar with that you take them for granted. The peace. I always tell young adults this. I love that age group and I always tell them this. Life is too short not to learn from other people's stupid mistakes. Learn from other people. Look and see what they've done wrong. Learn from people who are willing to sit down and take it and give you some advice. Because life is too short to make all your own mistakes. It really is. But you as the older, you're the one that steps out in faith and follows God and does that. And if God wants to say something to you today, is, yeah, you're not the drama queen. You're the older son. And he's saying, all that we have is yours. Okay? Does that make sense? All right, what if you are the drama queen? <laughs> My favorite. Okay. A couple of things. I believe life as God portrays it for us, and the idea of being a follower of Jesus Christ means you give and you receive. Focus on others. The drama queen is always guilty of focusing on themselves and trying to draw attention to themselves. Okay? If, if you are a taker, take, 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 ask your qu this question, how can I be a giver? If you are a giver, give, 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 ask this question, what's is okay for me to take? If, you're, if you find that you always have to be the center of attention, I tell you, as a fourth-born son, a little brother, and with all sisters, someone to ace drum all the way through high school, someone gets up every week and gets to talk to people and all those kind of things like that, there's a lot of the reward that I get for that where God has to say, Scott, I want you to give too. I want you to do these things too. When I was younger, I kind of grew up in a, in a family where I was a younger brother, but I also grew up in a family that didn't have much. And... It was amazing, miraculous, the people over the years that used to help me. You know, I'd go to church when I was in college, someone would shake my hand, there'd be a $20 bill there. You know, someone would send checks every month to support me. One lady, her, her husband was the mayor of Oakville at one point, and she was retired, her husband passed away, and every single month she sent me $100 while I was at Bible college. Every single month it'd be in her spidery hand writing would be this check and all that. And I remember, I kind of carried that attitude where, hey, it's great, God's going to help me, God's going to help me, God's going to help me. When God finally sat down with me and said, okay, now it's your turn. You're, you're not this poor kid anymore. Time to grow up. Why don't you try helping some people? And I learned the value of being a giver. It's awesome. It's really awesome. You know what I've learned? You can't outgive God. You know what else I've learned? Is that to give the gift is so healthy for me spiritually. It helps me let go of materialism because I can be materialistic. It helps me let go of greed. To give away and to bless other people is one of the highest callings of Christendom. It really and so is. So if awesome. you're the drama queen, you're using to get, 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 get. Question, how can you give? You say, well, I don't have much to give. Well, give what you can. Well, I don't know who to help. Oh, for Pete's sake, look around the room. Well, I don't know what to give them. Well, think about it. What would you like to get? You know, what, 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 how can I be a blessing to other people? Maybe it's a smile. Maybe it's a hug. Maybe it's a coffee. Maybe it's a gift. Maybe it's, it's you ringing their doorbell, leaving groceries on the doorbell, and running away laughing into the bushes. You know, whatever it is, you can do it. We all have something to give, no matter how poor we are or think we are. Second thing is learn to be God-reliant. God will fill that hole in our souls that needs to be filled. I ask, you know, the drama queen, the question is, is what is it you really want? And you know what most of us want? We want someone to see us and love us and focus on us, right? But the truth of the matter is, if I run around in life wanting that from people, then I'll never be satisfied. 
But Jesus, who said to the woman of the well, who herself was much of a drama queen, said, I will give you water you can drink, and from it you'll never be thirsty. And she said to him, give me this water. God fills a hole in our souls that cannot be filled by anything else. And trust me, as a pastor and as a person, I've tried and I've seen people try to fill it with everything else. There's only one thing that fills that hole, and that's God. Maybe today is the day where you say, all right, I've heard about this Jesus thing. I've heard about it. Now that I understand it, I need it. And tonight, or today, maybe the prayer you're going to pray is, God, I don't know much about you, but I'm in. Show me yourself. Help me learn what, what this means to be a, a follower of Jesus Christ. Maybe today's to take you step into that, recognizing that You've been trying to fill a hole in your soul for so many years. And God is saying, hey, I'm the only one that fits here. And then the third thing, learn discretion. God likes that. When you're blessing other people, if you're a person that does things dramatically, tendency is to want to bless people dramatically. Well, a question, you know, how can you do it discreetly? How can you do it discreetly? There's opportunities through our church this year uh, I was talking to Sarah Jane, who's a representative of the Student Administrative Council. She said the strike has particularly been harmful on the international students. She said many of them are paying thousands and thousands of dollars and they're out a lot more money because they had to pay for the weeks that the strike was going on and a lot of them can't go home for the holidays and, and that. And she said more and more of them are coming to access the food bank. And you know what? Every Sunday here, we, we have lots of international students who are involved and come and walk through. And uh, you know what? I, I like to do something for them in the new year. We're just working on some stuff with the ministry and team and, and that kind of thing to be a blessing to them. But one of the best things you can do is pick up a grocery card, pick up a Timmy's card, pick up something. And we'll give it to the SAC office and they'll distribute it to people that need it. And people you'll never meet. You won't know who got it. Yeah, it might get stolen. All kinds of things will happen to it. You don't know, but God will know. And someday, maybe there's a day where you're in heaven and someone's going to walk up to you and shake your hand and say, it was me. You helped me. You changed my life. I was starving and then I, I went to the Student Administrative Council where I was really down on or I needed a little pick-me-up. And, and, and I went there and they said, there's this church, the one that meets in the lobby on Sunday mornings. And, and they've given this food. They've given these cards. They've given this. And there'll be students that go, you know, maybe church isn't as irrelevant as I thought it was. Or what kind of people would give stuff to strangers? But God knows. God knows. And that is all I've got to say about that. So that's the drama queen message. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. I'm just going to open up. Uh, the, anybody has some questions or anything like that? Scotty's got the mic. So, uh, shoot, Jeremy, you got Jeremy up here? I don't know if this is a drama queen situation, but how do you deal with somebody that, like I had a experience this past Tuesday with a friend of mine. He says he's not my friend, but he says he didn't like his hand being shaken. Yeah. And to me, that was offensive. Okay. And it really hurt me a little bit. Yeah. So how do you deal with those kind of people in a situation that, have that kind of a problem yeah do you know what that's that's actually a respect thing people are made in the image of god and so if someone says to me i'm not comfortable shaking hands maybe they're a germaphobe maybe there's something like that but but to me be the bigger person and say okay you know can i slap you on the butt instead <laughs> just kidding <laughs> <laughs> kidding. <laughs> say to them hey i respect that and show them that warmth that a Christ follower would show them. Right? That's you get the best advice here, don't you? <laughs> See what happens? We all get laced out on chocolate up here. It's a good question, Jeremy. I like the idea <coughs> of, of being able to give anonymously because I know in the times of my life where somebody has done something and I'm not even aware of who it is, yeah. instead of focusing on what a great person that is and why, you know, it was just so awesome and feeling, you know, 
that okay I need to make sure that I help that person out when they need it or trying to reciprocate in some way when somebody does something that's anonymous my focus and my thankfulness is to God yeah. and it gives yeah. us you know as 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 an anonymous giver it gives us that opportunity yeah. to to fulfill what God's asked for us mm. um, have God you know because God's just and God sees and he yeah. rewards yeah let God do what he's going to do in terms of rewarding us for being faithful to what he's asked us to do yeah. but it gives it gives the receiver that opportunity to focus on him yeah. and on the fact that he's used somebody else to provide yeah. for their circumstance and their situation so there's so many good spin-offs for yeah. Yeah. for allowing those kinds of circumstances yeah. to happen yeah. Um, yeah. you know both for the giver and the receiver yeah that's good Krista you're pretty smart Okay, uh, now I got two chocolate bars for the next two questions. Nancy, okay. if this uh -huh. is a good question, you get a chocolate bar. If it's not... No, this is just a good story. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, it's a pay it forward. I was yep. in um, a sub shop, and I was just grabbing, you know, just a little corner sub shop, grabbing a little six-inch sub, yeah. trying really hard to understand the guy that was trying to put things on the sub because yeah. I couldn't understand him. Yeah. Two young lads were ahead of me. <coughs> yeah. And... Um, then one of them kind of turned towards me because the young lad ahead of me said, uh, he paid for my sub. I'm like, what? I said, you didn't have to do that. He goes, no, Merry Christmas, blah, blah, blah. Aww, and he just said, awesome. and then he went on to tell me that he worked in a restaurant yeah. just to come in and, you know, blah, blah, blah sometime. And I was so shocked. It was this such a nice thing to do? He wasn't, and hit, he wasn't hitting on you, right? <laughs> yeah, the old ladies. And anyway, <laughs> no, he was just, that was just so sweet, right? No, it was just awesome. like a pay it forward. That's all. That's and awesome. you just kind of go, yeah, you do want to do that, right? But yeah, I was yeah. so shocked, honestly. Anyway, it was awesome. a very nice story. That is so cool. So you need to buy somebody sub. Do you want dark chocolate or milk chocolate? You want dark. Okay, there you go. Give her a hand. That's a great story. Yeah. One more. Milk chocolate. Huh? Oh, you got it. Really? All right. You can't stop me now. There you go. That's awesome. Um, question. Not for like a family thing. How many drama people can you have in one, say, classroom? Yeah, one classroom. Um, uh, like well, a I can tell setting? you from experience if it's drama class, all of them. Well, just like regular <laughs> homeroom kind of classroom. <laughs> you know what? Uh, there's mixes and matches. Depends on the program. Oh, Lord. Like, you know, here's, here's the thing, okay? I might be one if, and two. If, you're, if you're, you're at a university where they have a humanities program, they're dramatic people, okay? Uh, when I was here at Sir Sanford, there was a noted difference between the business students and the ECE students. Okay, early childhood education. They were completely different. They were like aliens. By the way, here's your chocolate. Good question. So yeah, it, it depends on the program, the people, the preferences, all those kinds of things, okay? I, I remember I'd walk into an ECE thing and I'd had to get out of there. It was about saccharine as I could possibly stand. You walk into the business one, you're like, I'm going to get killed here. These people are so serious. You know, they're going to sit down and write a bar graph on my forehead or something. Okay, so that's, that's the reality of these things. Thank you for your questions. We're now going to pass the baskets around. There's outies and innies. Outies are the ones you take stuff out of. The innies are the ones you put stuff in. And uh, while we're doing that, we're going to have a quote show. Um, just something I want to say, okay, at Christmas, because as a pastor, I've learned this. Every time I preach a sermon like this, there'll be people among you who are going to say, Pastor, I really needed some help, but I didn't want to bother you. I didn't want to be a drama queen. If you need help, ask me. Please. Our church has the resources and abilities, and if we can help, we'll help. Okay? If, if, if you're sitting here and you're going, man, I have this need, but I won't bother him. I don't want to bother the pastor. He's, it's December. Nobody calls me. Okay? Ask me. I, I implore you to say that. I don't preach these sermons to get everybody to leave me alone. Okay, I preach these sermons to help you deal with different personalities that you have to deal with. And you know what? My backpack is if somebody's trying to take advantage of me, it's okay, I can handle it. Okay, If you need something, you need help, I'm your pastor. 
okay? And as your pastor, I want to help you. So if you need help, ask for it, okay? Because I always know that. I, uh, six months later, I finally, someone's going through a horrible situation. I said, why didn't you help me? Well, you know, I didn't want to be a burden. I didn't want to be a drama queen, okay? <laughs> hey, I, I, this is not what it's trying to get across today, okay? Does that make sense? All right, enjoy the quote show, and then we'll close in the song.